All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order, and we're going to get started today. Um, commissioners, before we get to our action items, which we have two of today, uh, we have three things at the top of our meeting that I would like to spend a little bit of time on. And for the first one, I'm going to go over here to the podium to welcome some uh, diplomats from two of our sister cities to join us today. So I'm going to go up here. Um, afterwards, I'll give each of them an opportunity to speak, and then we'll get some pictures before we get to the next item. All right. So we are so pleased to welcome guests from two of our sister cities to be with us today. From our sister cities, Bielska Biała, Poland, and Omi Hachiman, Japan. Uh, we have two delegations here with us this morning. The Bielska Biała uh, delegation, which includes the deputy mayor, head of strategy and economic development, and head of promotion. They have been here in Grand Rapids since last week on Wednesday. And this is the very first visit to the United States and to Grand Rapids for all three of them. So during the, yes, we should clap for that. I'll share with you a little tidbit. So we uh, were with them in this room last week, and as we were looking at the image we have from our sister city in Poland, the deputy mayor pointed out that the image that we have is actually of City Hall, and you can see where his office is on the second floor there. So it was really a great discussion. Uh, but during their visit, I've had the opportunity to spend time with them. Uh, they have uh, enjoyed Art Prize, uh, Pulaski Days, including uh, joining me on Saturday for the Pulaski Days Parade. Uh, they head back to Poland tomorrow. Uh, we certainly have enjoyed getting to know them and participating in another really wonderful cultural exchange between our cities. So we're grateful to this Grand Rapids Sister Cities uh, Biaska Biawa Committee for helping us provide this wonderful experience here in Grand Rapids from our friends. So I'll talk a little bit about Omi Hachiman as well, and then I'll give each of you an opportunity to say a few words, and then we'll do a picture. Um, so the Omi Hachiman delegation totals 20 people, and if you all want to stand up. Um, <clears throat> And it includes their superintendent of education, four teachers, and several business and community leaders. They are here from October 9th until the 11th, and we look forward to spending time with them later on today and having them spend some time in our amazing city. So last year marked the 30th anniversary of our sister city's relationship with Omi Hachiman. They are our oldest sister city relationship. We are grateful to the Omi Hachiman people and the Grand Rapids Sister City International Omi Hachiman Committee for this incredibly rich friendship. A few of the factors that went into our pairing as sister cities were the shared freshwater coastlines and shared history as part of our furniture industry. So I want to thank everyone who made this possible and for making sure that our friends have a great visit. So we look forward to many more cultural exchanges uh, with both Biaska Biawa as well as Omi Hachiman. And hopefully one of these days as mayor I'll be able to visit both. So I now want to invite members from Biaska Biawa to come up and say a few words. Uh, we'll take a picture and then I'll invite some uh, individuals from Omi Hachiman to come and say a few words. So we'll start with, with Poland. <coughs> Good to see you again, Mayor. <laughs> Happy to Mayor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Chciałem serdecznie podziękować pani burmistrz i, i wszystkim mieszkańcom Bielska Grand Rapids za zaproszenie do tego pięknego miasta. Uh, we'd like to thank to the mayor and all of you to invite us to your beautiful city. <laughs> Bielsko Biała i Grand Rapids to są miasta dość podobne. Bielsko Biała and Grand Rapids are quite similar cities. Odległe o tysiące mil. Uh, thousands of miles uh, away from each other. Ale jesteśmy sobie bardzo bliscy. But we are very close to each other. Uh, przez te kilka dni, kiedy byliśmy w Grand Rapid, mogliśmy poznać ludzi i miasto. For those few days spent here, we had an occasion to, to get to know the city and people. Oczywiście nie jesteśmy identycznymi miastami, ale bardzo, bardzo podobnymi pod względem i powierzchni i mieszkańców. Uh, our cities are quite similar uh, considering the surface and uh, the population. Uh, 
zasadnicza różnica to jest taka, że Bielskowiała jest miastem położonym w górach. Najwyższy punkt to jest 1120 metrów, a najniższy 200 metrów. The main difference is uh, our situation, well, that Bielsko Biała is situated at feet of the mountains and our lowest point is uh, at 200 meter over the sea level and the highest at 1,120 meters. Ale wczoraj widzieliśmy łososie tutaj na rzece. <laughs> Yesterday we saw salmons uh, in your river. Łososi nie ma. <laughs> so we don't have them in Bielsko Biała. <laughs> Serdecznie zapraszamy wszystkich mieszkańców Grand Rapid do naszego miasta. We invite you from, from our heart to visit Bielskowiała. Chcę powiedzieć, że byliśmy również na Dniach Pułaskiego, na Photo Art, Art Prize Festival. Yes, we, uh, we, we were on the parade, uh, Pułaski Day, and also we saw many exhibitions uh, of the Art Prize. Ja jestem zachwycony waszym miastem, waszym pięknym miastem. Uh, I'm, well, how to say, I'm astonished and your, your city seems very beautiful to me. Są podobieństwa nie tylko między naszymi miastami, ale też między narodami, Stany United States i Polska. There are also similarities between uh, your state and Poland. To uh, u was była Konstytucja w 1787 roku, jako pierwsza na świecie, nowoczesna. Uh, your constitution was the first uh, in the world. A w Polsce w 1791 pierwsza konstytucja nowoczesna w Europie. And in Poland we have the first modern uh, constitution in Europe. Uh, it was in uh, 1791. To historia, a czasy obecne. That's history and presently. To Polska współpracuje ze Stanami Zjednoczonymi no, na szeregu y, płaszczyzna. Poland cooperates with the United States uh, in many different uh, subjects. Chociażby na tej trudnej, jak y, udział naszych wojsk przy wojskach amerykańskich. For example, uh, our armies cooperate. Jeszcze raz chciałem bardzo, bardzo serdecznie podziękować Pani Burmistrz. Once, once more many thanks to the mayor and all of you and the committee of Sister City who takes care so much of us. I serdecznie witamy również zaprzyjaźnione miasto z Japonii. Yes, and uh, welcome to, to the friendly city from Japan. And next we will ask um, some folks from Omi Hachiman to come forward and share a few words about their trip and their relationship with us. あの、私は日本語だけですので、あの、通訳で彼にお願いしたいと思います。え、日本から会ってきました大宮八幡市20名の団員のみんなです。よろしくお願いいたします。So he's not a fluent in English, so he's just going to speak in in Japanese and I'll uh, translate. He's uh, heading the group of 20 delegates from Omi Hachiman City, your sister city. 
日本では先週とっても寒くて今週すごくこうアメリカへ来るのが心配やったんですが特に寒くないかなと思ったら割に暖かかったんですが今朝がどうもとても寒くて驚いています。<笑> So, right now, the climate in Japan i s still、um, kind of summertime for here. So,、uh, when, they arrived, uh, when we arrived at around 7 30 p.m., it was warm, so they were、uh, relieved. However, this morning it was quite chilly. Shimi, Shio, Sama, Hajime, Shino, Kambu, no Mina san, so, Kara, Guzen, this guy, Poland, no. 友人たちとても歓迎をしていただいてありがとうございます。So we'd like to thank you,、uh, Mayor and all the、uh, city、uh, members and、uh, our friends over at、uh, um, our sister, sister city of sister cities、uh, from Poland.、Uh, thank you all for having us this morning. 市長からあロザリン・ブリス市長に新書を預かってきましたので、朗読させてもらいます。So I'd like to read a、uh, letter from our mayor,、uh, Mr. Fujitani. <笑>終了の子、ロザリン・ブリス市長様におかれましては、ますますご減少のこととお喜び申し上げます。続けていいですか。ヘイソは本市と大宮島、うん、本市との姉妹都市交流において、格別のお力添えを賜り、厚くお礼申し上げます。昨年度はグランドラピッツ市、大宮八幡市姉妹都市30周年記念式典に、本市職員をお招きいただいた上、記念品までご頂戴いただきましたこと、厚くお礼申し上げます。またこの度は本市より総勢20名が岸州を訪問させていただきました岸市での滞在の折にはどうか格別のご後輩を賜りますようお願い申し上げます本来でありましたら私も初めて岸市にお伺いし美しい町並みや自然を拝見し友好の絆を深めさせていただく予定でございましたがどうしても他の公務が重なり、念願が叶えられず、残念でなりません。ぜひ、次の機会にはお伺いし、友好を深められることを楽しみにしております。最後になりましたが、岸のますますのご発展と、ローザリン・ブリス市長様、皆様、市民の皆様、ご多幸をお祈りいたします。2017年10月10日アメリカ合衆国ミシガン州グランドラピッツ市長ロザン・ブリス様、日本国滋賀県大見八幡市長、藤谷英一。So I'll read the English letter. Dear Mayor Rosalind Bliss, my name is Eisho、uh, Fujitani. I am the mayor of a o m i Hachiman City. I deeply appreciate your hospitality during a city office member's visit last year. In order to participate in our 30 year anniversary ceremony between Grand Rapids and Omihachiman. Also, thank you very much for the lovely gifts you sent back for us. This year, a massive delegation of 20 members from Omihachiman will be visiting Grand Rapids. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you in advance for the gracious hospitality I am sure you will show them during this day. I was looking forward to enjoying Grand Rapids' abundant nature and beautiful city scenery. As well as participating in first hand and deepening our bonds of friendship between our two cities. Unfortunately, other official business prevents me from making that journey at this time. I would very much like to visit Grand Rapids in the future to see you. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude for all of your kindness and cooperation up to this point, and my hope for the continuous. Continuous development of the city and a healthy, happy, and prosperous future for you and all of your citizens. Sincerely, Eisho Fujitani. Uh, mayor. Oh. English letter. Origami. 
これ、浮世絵、これ、新書です。This is a handmade、um, art piece from、uh, uh, Omihachiman City and some origami pieces. Yes, that would be great. I can show them. She would open it. So あ、Welcome. Thank you, commissioners, for、uh, being patient with that. And next, that will take us to our next presentation today. And we have some guests here with us for that as well.、Uh, and so we are going to take a little bit of time to talk about the recent、uh, Kent County front of the court report. So I have a number of folks here.、Uh, and I will invite up Judge Zemitis. Always good to see you. We go way back. So it's always nice to see you. And Mary, are you going to speak too? Okay. So, Commissioner Bolkowski, welcome.、Uh, and I am going to try to keep you, I don't know, what were y'all told 10 minutes? I'll try to keep you on that. So, if you get too chatty, Commissioner. You better put the timer on. <laughs> you know me.、Uh, 
unfortunately you do. Um, so thank you uh, and welcoming us from the far off land of Kent County. Um, <laughs> It's good to be bring here. Bring a gift. What's that? <laughs> what was that? I said, did you bring a gift? I, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Double up next time. Um, yeah, we're here um, representing the Friend of the Court um, Advisory Committee. Also, who should be with us is Commissioner Lanier, who helped a lot um, within the process, which I'm sure is no surprise to all of you, nor to us. Tony Jaliffe is with Strong Fathers, and again, Judge Zomitis from the building across the way as well. Um, real quick, um, from my perspective, this probably had roots before it, but one year ago this Thursday, and the reason why I know it, this Thursday is our annual one and only 6 p.m. meeting as a county commissioner. I've got attitudes about that, but I won't share them. Um, but we have our 6 p.m. meeting, and at that meeting, usually one or two people show up. We had 60 African-American men who came forward and said, what you did, sending two deputies into our community to enforce bench warrants, wasn't the, the right best thing to do. We're committed to work with you to get to a better solution. To me, again, as a community organizer, I was envious of the power that was organized and brought to bear at that night. It took not too long for the chair and the chief judge, chair of the county commission, Jim Saufeld and the chief judge, to appoint the advisory committee. Um, stakeholders from around the community, um, commissioners and uh, city commissioner, Sunita Lanier, Judge Zemitis and Tony were also part of that. And as you know, most of government isn't fit for, for TV because it's just long and tedious. Looking at each piece of the friend of the court process, where are there opportunities for improvement? Throughout it all, there were very powerful um, lessons that I know I got a lot from Tony and Commissioner Lanier and others about cultural competency and what does that mean and what doesn't that mean? Um, so throughout this, again, um, I think we, we came up with a really good set of recommendations. And the judge will talk about it some, and, and Tony as well. But the coolest thing is uh, improvements are already happening. The front of the court and the courts are already starting to make changes um, that we, there was no need to wait for this. We actually also um, approved the change just an hour ago at the Legislative Human Resources Committee that a county commissioner will be on the standing front of the court advisory committee. Um, as you know, sometimes people, not to say they didn't act appropriately before, but sometimes it changes when there's a commissioner in the room. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having a commissioner on that. So that's changing. and. And my last piece is to say, we all know that um, a lot of this comes down to capacity, and capacity means budget, means trying to say to the manager or our administrator, can't you find just a few extra $100,000? Um, and so I brought that up a couple of weeks ago at one of our finance committee meetings that I was invited to um, as a commissioner, and, and I will keep that. That's my personal, but also I know there's other commissioners that um, support that, is we have to continue to support this capacity. Definitely needing to take direction from the courts and the front of the court. However, um, in addition to adding a um, commissioner to that front of the court advisory committee. We also took the customer service um, recommendations and um, how well are we doing in the early um, identification and early intervention um, that that will be measured that is part of that committee's charge now. So, so again, we're moving forward never as fast as citizens would like, but hopefully as fast as commissioners would expect. So I'll let uh, Tony and the judge have a few comments. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to try to explain how we got here in the shortest form. Um, I am I sit on the uh, Citizen Advisory Committee as I represent the non-custodial parent, whether it be man or woman. That's who I represent. And it was brought to our attention that they were going to um, bring um, in two deputies to go do door-to-door -door, um, warrant searches. Well, all too often in African American community, that doesn't play out well. Um, so we were alarmed and we were um, definitely had some apprehensions. Once um, 
like Dave said, that uh, we did show that we had some concerns and came to the to the um, county committee meeting. Um, wheels started turning pretty quickly, actually a lot faster than I ever seen government work in my entire life. Um, a lot of good things came out of that, um, and but we still have some more work to be done. Um, here we are right now, nearly one quarter of these warrants are in 49507, one quarter. Half of these warrants are in two zip codes, 07 and 03. We have an issue in our city, um, and not to be not to go on with it, but I'm a PBS and an NPR kind of a guy, right? So I, I'm, I, I record my PBS and I get a chance to watch it when I get an opportunity. And I was catching up on some of the Vietnam War, and it talked about this gentleman who was shot in both legs, right? And when he made it to the surgeon, they told him that we can save one leg, but we're going to probably lose the other. I thought about that as a child. How often do they just get to one leg? What happened to their other leg? They need both, they need both parents. And if we have this crisis in 04, I'm sorry, in 03 and 07, we need to address it, not just on the county level, but on the city level as well. We have to. These are, these fatherless children grow into fatherless adults, right? I think about the shenanigans I have to deal with my children, me and my wife together. And if she had to do that by herself, like my mom did, I would, I would lose it if it was just me. You know, children need both, um, both parents really just need both parents. And I really want for you guys to take a look at this and, and understand what can you do from that. Again, two zip codes that's inside the city. You know, 07 and half of these warrants are in just two zip codes. So I really would like to see us do more and to address this situation. And thank you again for your time. Your Honor, co commissioners, uh, others and guests, on behalf of Judge McNabb and myself, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I call the silent revolution. Because one of the things we're going to do here, and we're already moving on the circuit court family division level, is to do what we call an adopt court. Now that stands for acquiring DNA and paternity timely. And this is how it will work. Unmarried folks, because if you're married, you're already going to be the father, Unmarried folks will get together and sign a contract with the court to do a number of things. The first thing they'll do is before the child is born, they will take a DNA test. Once the child is born, and sometimes with modern technology now, you can take that DNA test before the child is born, but you'll find out if you have a father or not. The fathers, remember this is all voluntarily, the fathers will then go and get to the prosecutor's office a determination that they are indeed going to be the legal father. They'll also go along with the mother to the front of the court to establish child support on an, uh, on an actual basis. No guesses, no imputations on an actual basis. Uh, and they'll set down something that we don't have for months under the current system parenting time schedules for the father. They'll put all of this together. When they put it together, they then come to the, uh, the adopt court judge, which will be either Judge McNabb or myself under current plans, and we will establish what we call a DP case, or a case which gives the father all the legal requirements, parenting time, and child support. Now, who wins? Well, clearly, everybody wins. The lady's got money coming in for a newborn that's this long. The father has parenting time right off the bat like he wants and should have and makes it father involved. And of course, with that parenting time comes some child support, which makes everybody uh, satisfactory. But it goes beyond that. That's certainly the human level, but it goes beyond that. Look at your budgets. If you find out that somebody's not the father right off the bat, nobody's gonna go try to find him because he's gonna run. He doesn't want to pay child support. There's going to be warrants, and it's going to be months. We won't have the warrants that you're talking about. One court has already done this in the state, and it amazes me that only one has done it. Judge McNabb and I immediately saw that this was good for us to take care of this problem, and probably good for the state. They found that 35% of the men who took the test, the lady said, you're the father, is not the father. Well, just think about that. This fellow isn't going to be chased anymore. He has no responsibilities. He's, he certainly knows the issue there, and so does the mother, who then can go on and do the repeat thing for to find out who is, so she can have all of these things again. And the goal is 60 days. Now, just think of that. Silent revolution, you betcha. 60 days to have a father in the household, legal with parenting time and child support that's accurate. 
That's coming out of this group that we did here. And of course, it's going to reduce the need for warrants. If you don't have warrants, you don't need a fellow with a gun going out to try to collect them. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. The whole county will win. And we hope that we'll be able to do it in conjunction with the other county, which happens to be the city of Flint the County of, uh, of uh, over there, uh, and be able to show this as, a, as a, uh, uh, how it works for the whole state one day. Thank you again. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. um, also want to thank our colleague, Commissioner Linear, who spent a lot of time on this. So thank you, Commissioner, um, for your work. And I know it'll be ongoing work. Any uh, commissioners, any questions or comments? This was meant to be an update. I know there's more work to do as we look to implementation and look at ways that we can continue to partner with the county. I think I got 30 seconds. I mean, just to, just to quickly. Sorry, sorry, and the timer's not going. I, I work on the timer. 30 seconds. I mean, to, to, there really is some also cultural pieces. When I had the opportunity to present this to the county commission, um, I got to slightly remind people that I do have a, a Juris Doctor, and we forget that our court system was built in England in the medieval times and we brought it over to America. And so when we talk about cultural competency for all of us, it, the court is meant, no, no disrespect, Your Honor, the court is, is meant to keep us in our place. And so some of us, again, as an aside, say, do we really need a friend of the court? Because the court's already got a lot of friends and a lot of power. It was Commissioner Voorhees of Wyoming who said, we need a friend of the family. And also with that cultural shift, right now, the friend of the court partners most with the Department of Human Services. And the Department of Human Services, when they walk in, they have a book of sanctions. And it's about compliance. And we talked about as a committee, why isn't the friend of the court also partnering with the Department of Health? Because the Department of Health comes in and it's like, oh, we're here to help you raise your baby and then to create a family. So we've, we've done a lot. We still have a lot to do with infant mortality stuff. But again, it's the health department, a whole different mindset. So I'm done with my 30 seconds. Thank you for your patience. You know where we hang out. So we continue uh, to look forward to working with you for this implementation and more. And maybe some some budget items later <laughs> in, in next year's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, commissioners, next that will take us to our third item before we get to an action item. And um, this came from uh, some experiences this past week. So, so we all know um, after the terrible tragedy in LA, we were uh, in Las Vegas, I'm sorry. Um, there we go. Let me start over. Um, so we all know that after the terrible tragedy in Las Vegas, uh, we were really shocked and heartbroken. And we continue to send out our um, thoughts and our prayers to the families and friends of the victims, but also to that entire community. And um, after, after that tragedy, uh, many of us were asked questions about uh, what, uh, what would we do if a tragedy such as that happened in our community and if we as a city were prepared for a crisis such as that. And from that came a conversation that I had um, with the city manager. Uh, I um, and am actively updated on our crisis response in our community and the work that we're doing with the county. And from that conversation, we asked the chief to join us today at Committee of the Whole and just spend a couple minutes talking about uh, the work that has been done for many, many years uh, in this community around making sure that we are um, prepared. Of course, we hope a crisis uh, such as this never happens in our city or any other city. Um, but if it does, uh, we want to make sure that the community knows that we have been putting plans in place to make sure that we're prepared. So Chief, thank you for joining us and just talking briefly about our crisis preparedness. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioner, City Manager. Uh, to your point, Mayor, I'll speak very generically. The last thing we want to do is speak too specifically regarding tactics uh, or responses. Having said that, in light of the tragedy that uh, affected Las Vegas and really the entire community, we took a fresh set of eyes, a fresh look at our preparedness. And I'm confident in saying that for a mid-sized city, we are as well prepared as any organization across the country. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is our training, the individuals who we have uh, who've received specialized training in terms of crowd management, uh, hosting large-scale events, whether it's the uh, River Bank Marathon that we host, whether it's our art prize crowds. The other is the equipment. 
uh, we are as well equipped as any agency our size in the nation. And that's credit to the commission and the community for supporting those purchases. Thirdly is our experience. Uh, as Grand Rapids becomes more of a destination city, we are continually tasked. Uh, there is rarely a weekend in the summer where there's not an event going on. Having said that, there's additional spontaneous events that are taking place um, throughout the summer at Rosa Parks, at our parks, that demand a police presence. So what I shared with uh, some members of the community is a couple of things. One is some of our presence is very overt. You'll see officers, and, and our prize is a good example. You saw officers on segways, you saw officers on horseback, you saw officers on foot patrol, and you saw us in marked units. What you didn't see was some individuals in plain clothes capacity. What you didn't see was officers in unmarked cars, officers who were stationed in places that gave them a strategic vantage point of the crowd in case any issues were to emerge. Um, in addition, we have very close relationships with our federal counterparts. We have a detective who's assigned to the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force, and we get real-time information as fresh as our federal counterparts can provide. So whether it's the state, uh, Michigan State Police, giving us information from MIOC in terms of any emerging threats, whether it's our FBI counterparts, we have officers who are assigned to the FBI Task Force, U.S. Marshals, DEA, which gives us a force multiplier of the resources of the federal government should any issues arise, and more significantly, gives us the intelligence that the, our federal counterparts are able to provide us. So I guess I would close in saying, um, for a city of 200,000 people, when you look at the, at the training, the equipment, the experience, and the support, I don't think you can find a safer city of our size in terms of hosting special events. That being said, I also made this point, safety is a community issue. So when we hold, hold these events, I know the, the saying or the, the term came out post 9-11, if you see something, say something. We are really reliant to a large extent on an involved populace. So we need community interaction. We need community members if they're at a special event or even in their, day, their daily interactions if it's not a special event, if they become of suspicious of something that they think should be pursued in terms of additional attention, don't hesitate to call us. That's what we're here for is to safeguard everyone's community and, and I'm sorry, to safeguard everyone and that takes an active populace. Are there any questions I can answer for you regarding our response or? Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I'll turn to my colleagues see if they have questions. And I appreciate you talking about that last point, that we, this really is a community effort. Very much so. Uh, any questions, commissioners? Great. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Really appreciate it. All right, commissioners, next that will take us to our uh, first item before us today, and that is a resolution setting monthly, daily, and event parking rates for the McConnell lot. Can I get a motion? I love. All right, Mr. Josh Nearmore is here to talk to us about this. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, so you may recall that back in April, we brought forth an action item to enter into a lease agreement and license agreement with K&K uh, &K investors to actually lease the property uh, across the street from the downtown market. Then shortly thereafter, um, in June, there was an approval of a construction contract. So we started construction um, at the end of uh, July, and we are on track to um, have it completed uh, probably early to mid-November. Um, what we need to do now is actually set the rate structure for that, and that requires city commission approval. So one thing I want to point out is we've actually hosted two different community meetings down there in the area because we were talking not only about the new lot but also maybe some potential changes to the on-street parking that highlighted some concerns from the existing residents <coughs> within the Klingman and Baker lofts as well as some of the surrounding area so we're holding off on doing any changes to any of the on-street parking in the immediate vicinity to have more and better conversations with the community as well as to do some data collection and tracking of how it's being used and what the impact of the new facility is so you may recall that there it's a surface parking lot, but there are two tiers to it. So I just want to quickly briefly go over the two different rate structures and why we set them uh, accordingly. So for the lower level, which is going to have an entrance right off of Ionia Street directly across from the market, we're going to treat that more like extra on-street parking. So there's a little over 90 spaces there, and we are tying that rate exactly to the same rate for on-street parking in the immediate vicinity, which is $1.50 an hour. And this is gonna be slightly different because we are going to regulate this 24 hours, and the reason for that is we need to be able to snow plow it and clean it and do maintenance and custodial services in the overnight. So we're gonna restrict parking from 3 to 5 a.m., but it will be a 24-hour enforced facility. Um, 
because we're not we are not allowed to put gates on the lower level for some traffic safety concerns. So for the upper level surface lot, which will be, um, you can access it off of McConnell, there's a little over 200 spaces there and we're going to treat this like any of our regular gated 24-7 access facilities. So our proposed monthly parking rate for commuters will be $86 a month, um, which is directly the same rate as the Market Street lot and some, or excuse me, the Area 6A lot, which is just behind Area 4 and 5 underneath uh, the freeway. And that's the closest sort of proximity to a similar lot. And and also this is very transit accessible with both access to the Silver Line, Fairless uh, area as well as Dash. So we feel like it'll be a very heavily utilized commuter facility. Um, along like, uh, we're also tying it to the same rates that we have for the adjacent, uh, or excuse me, parking ramps for the hourly and the half hour rate of $1.25 an hour. And then we've also done similar schedules with a daily max of $12 and a special event rate of $8. All right. So any questions? Commissioners, any questions? I think we've all seen this uh, lot being constructed uh, as we've made our way over that way. So, questions, comments? Uh, Commissioner Kelly, do you serve on parking? Yeah, I do. And of course, we were presented this information as well, but <clears throat> really appreciate the um, proactive approach. We, we really got on it in order to accommodate the, the real need for parking downtown. So, thank you so much, Josh. Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? <coughs> it carries. All right, thank you, Josh. All right, that will take us to our next item, and this is going to, uh, it'll be twofold. Um, and it's a discussion on the city manager recruitment process. So we have Mary Beth Jalks and Joellen from GovHRUSA. I know all of you had an opportunity to speak with Joellen this past month, and or past week, I should say. Um, and so after talking to all of us and spending some time with Mary Beth, uh, she has some recommendations to present to us today and to get feedback from us so that she can move forward. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, I was going to out someone today, but I'm not going to. I'm going to be nice <laughs> and say thank you all for getting in touch with the consultant right away. I want you to know she told me that this is such a smart commission. I told her I, they're smart and high maintenance, but they are smart. So <laughs> I'm very, very pleased with your responses to her. She's very impressed already uh, with the information you've provided. Joellen is going to spend the time to go through everything that she's put together that we've worked on. Uh, but one thing I do want you to know is that um, the, uh, and Commissioner, new elect uh, uh, Kurt Repart is here too. So he's he also gave a contribution to the profile. Um, but one thing I want you to know is that uh, after today, things are going to move fairly rapidly. And so from henceforth, unless there's a particular reason that uh, you all may want uh, Joellen to come back, uh, we're, you, she's going to go through all the recruitment schedule. We probably won't be back here until a pivotal point uh, at the, towards the end of the recruitment schedule. So the city clerk does have the uh, recruitment schedule. She's going to verify on the 2018 dates to make sure they are good when you all have to convince and other than that, I'm turning it over to Joellen. Great. Thank you. And, and Mary Beth, before you do that, thank you. You've spent a lot of time with Joellen, a lot of time on this process, giving a lot of good input, and I really want to just say thank you. Welcome back, Joellen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and members of the commission. And I'm looking at the computer and trying to figure out where the documents are that I gave you so we could put them up. Tom is our de facto IT guy. I know, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> I see some stuff right here, but I'm, is this it right here on the side now? No, they're open. We, we all have hard copies oh. before us as well, so. so. And uh, Commissioner Elector Park, good to have you here. Yeah. Thank you for uh, being engaged so in this down. process. Yeah, you just, you can scroll Before down you get sworn in in December. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
thank you. Thank you for your help. Uh, the first document is just um, a list of everything that you have. Uh, I have a list of the uh, meetings with, not the meetings, the identified stakeholder groups, uh, the community and employee survey, and um, also the fact that we have established an email to receive direct input um, to me, and it, the email is grandrapids at govhrusa.com. So if you do have any constituents that um, fill out the community survey or want to send me a direct email, please give them that email. Everything will be contained there. Uh, so, And then also this morning, I do have a recruitment timeline for you to look at. Uh, it has two options for the interview process. The first one is a more condensed option, which allows you to have, actually me, to have more uh, time on the front end to vet the candidates, and then on the back end uh, to negotiate an employment agreement. If we move to the stakeholder list, uh, there is a draft. Uh, and you can see that there are nine groups that were established. And I have to thank the mayor, Mary Beth. Uh, this was a very comprehensive list, and I thank all of you for all of your input on stakeholders that you would like to be uh, see included in the process. So here is the list. We have um, a stakeholder group for the business community, for public partners and leaders, for neighborhood businesses and locally owned businesses, for community partners and leaders, nonprofit leaders, neighborhood associations, clergy, the Urban Core Collective and Equity Pack, and then a millennials group. So there are nine groups that have been identified on this list. There are individuals on the list as well. And the idea is that I would be back in the city um, at, for two different weeks. Um, it's the 25th and 26th, I think, and then right around uh, Halloween, so half day and then the morning of the next day and the evening. And Mary Beth would work with me uh, to set up some meetings with all of these different stakeholder groups. Um, in addition to that, I will be meeting with uh, union leadership today, uh, with uh, city uh, manager, deputy city manager, top management. Um, it, sometime throughout the process, I will be back next week as well for some of those internal meetings too. So. So um, here is the list of the community stakeholders, and then I will be meeting with um, in city staff as well. Okay. Um, also, and, and you and have. Ellen, can I add something um, real quick? So, commissioners, this was this list was um, really ga gathered from conversations she had with each of you. You'll remember one of the questions she asked was, "Who do you want to make sure is included in stakeholder um, meetings, and who is?" Uh, I know you asked a lot of questions, but anyway, you all provided input. Mary Beth provided input. I provided input. If you can take a look at this list today, if there's any additions, please get them back to Joellen today because we're going to work on getting invites out to these folks and getting these meetings set up this week so that people have time to get them on their schedule. Um, and then I'll let you talk a little bit about if people can't attend this, there will also be an electronic way to provide input. Yes, so in addition, so everyone will have an invite from the mayor to attend one of the meetings. And obviously because of the time constraints, w there will be a time established for the meeting, a uh, meeting time and location. Um, if someone is invited to the meeting and they cannot attend the meeting, um, the questionnaire that you all receive from me will be provided to everyone who is invited to the meeting. So if they cannot attend, they can fill out that questionnaire, email it to me directly. They could also take the community survey uh, that I'll talk about in a minute, and they can also email me at the, the email I just provided. So there are three ways or methods that people could still get e information to me if for some reason they're not able to attend the meeting in person. Um, in addition to that, uh, there will be two surveys that will be available. One survey is for the community, um, and one survey is for the employees. The survey actually is very similar to the one that was used for Kent County Administrator. We also used it for ICMA, Executive Director. We found it to be very effective. It's pretty broad-based. There's a lot of um, opportunity for people to check attributes for the new manager, as well as give input um, about uh, challenges and opportunities he or she may face upon commencing employment. So both, sim both surveys are similar for the community and for the employees. The difference with the community survey is that 
at the end of it, we have optional information for you um, to gather about the residents you, or, or anyone who fills it out. It could be um, the zip code, it has the ethnicity, and um, it, it also, I, there was one other question at the very end of it. But the idea behind that is that you're using your 311 system to get information from the community. So we thought this would be a good test for you to see if it's a good way to uh, receive information back for this purpose. In addition to the electronic survey that will be available for 311 for the community, uh, we will make hard copies and make them available throughout the city. So, and that list will be published uh, as well so people will know where they can get hard copies of the survey. They will be collected by city staff and they will be inputted by 311 staff. So if people do not have access to a computer, they will have the opportunity to fill it out in hard copy and then that information will be inputted by 311. Uh, on the in oh yes ma'am can we talk a little bit more about the community survey um so commissioners uh after some conversations uh a couple of things i want to point out one is that the survey will be available in english and spanish um, and the decision to partner with 311 to help disseminate the information um, but to collect it also is that if we identify through 311 that there are certain neighborhoods that we're not um, getting a lot of feedback from, then we'll do some t more targeted outreach to those neighborhoods. Uh, and so Joellen will be working closely with Becky Jo in that process um, just for the community survey. So the employee survey is going to be done differently. Um, but for the community survey, we're going to try to partner really closely with 311 to make sure that we get adequate across the city feedback. Yeah, th uh, thanks for that, Mayor. Just um, one, one question that I had. It seems like there's only one yes or no question in the survey. And so uh, I kind of wanted to, to talk through that because I think a lot of the other ones are very open and allow for um, more more comments. And it's it's either um, question four or, or, or question five, depending on the, the survey that you have, basically says, you know, do, do you think it's necessary to have um, county or city level uh, experience? And and I think what, what the, the questions after is, do you have the leadership ability to do that? And I think that's more open than, because as I'm reading through that, I'm thinking yes is the only right answer because it's twice, and no is the answer without anything else put behind it. It, it just seems to lead that, that, that I would likely only answer that question yes or seeing two yeses that explain behind it. So I think we should review that one just in the sense of getting after what it is that we're really really trying to get get with that that question. The, the, the purpose of the question is to ask whether or not people feel as if the new person has to have a background in city or county management. That's the only, that's all we're asking because sometimes people will say, oh, it's okay if there's somebody who comes from the private sector or the academic community. So that's, that's why it is so specific. At the end of the survey, there is an opportunity for people to ask other, you know, um, include other comments. But if you want to expand that question to see if there's any other um, background people would be looking at, uh, but, but we wanted it to be specific because sometimes there'll be commission or there'll be community members that'll say it doesn't matter to us if they have a background in yeah, city so, management or not. Yeah, so I think just how you phrase that, though, is different than, than how it's asked here. If, if, if you're asking, oh, would it be all right to have, you know, private sector or academic experience is a different question than do you have to have this? I, I just think that the way that it's worded, worded to me seems like it's almost... Lee, I, I can I can I could probably tell you about a seventy five percent chance you're gonna say yes just how it's ranked okay. how the question is in, in my mind, maybe I'm wrong, but so Commissioner, do you recommend that we saying. add similar to the other questions a box for other that says please specify and give people an opportunity to weigh in? Well I would just say some. maybe you know, provide some more a background as to as to what 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 you're asking. Meaning, like, is it is it important to have the or maybe rank it or what would it be what it be not? Because I think if if you're saying that you want to take someone from business or academic world, it would be important to at least note that within the question. Yeah, I, I think it's fine to add an, an other or please specify similar to the other questions, and and that's I think the opportunity for someone to say, mm -hmm. you know be great if they had other maybe they you know ran a, a college or university or you know large hospital system whatever um, right. similar size so I think what do you think Joellen sure we can we can work on that we'll rephrase we'll rephrase the introduction and then we'll make sure that there's that, enough opportunity yeah, for people to put other ideas in as yeah. well okay. sure. are, are you yep. all comfortable with that absolutely yeah. okay yeah. 
Oh, so commissioners, the rest any... of it's really good, though. I just want to state that. Okay. No, that's overall. a good. That's a yeah. really good point. So thanks, Commissioner. Any other questions, Commissioner Lanier? So we, when we were looking at um, creating our own survey, we we modified the introductory paragraph to help the public to understand what a city manager is. I know we know what that is, we know that term, we use it all the time, but that doesn't mean that the citizens of our community is familiar with the city manager being the CEO and, and the person running the show. So is there a way for us to share the language that we had with Joellen so that they can um, potentially use that um, here at the beginning of the survey? Yeah. Mary Beth worked on that survey, so I think, yeah. and she's saying yes. So, so I'm looking at the schedule, and it looks like October 11th is when the community and city employee input process begins. So it's fine for us to then share this out and tell people that 311 would be ready as of tomorrow. Well, um, I, for process-wise, I think let's let's solidify this. Let's allow an opportunity to make those changes. Okay. Um, and then we will have it live, and then that link will be sent out to all of us. But it'll also be Mayor Beth has a whole list of. Um, I should say you have a whole list of, of things you're going to do to get the word out about the survey, um, including a press release and getting out to our community partners. And so we'll be working with 311 on getting the word out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as we send you the link and say okay. it's live, send it out to the world. We will be doing some radio ads, some other things to really make sure, in addition to dropping a distribution list of hand copies, as we've done before for surveys, uh, to make sure we send saturate uh, the community and everyone knows about this. Great. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, and so, um, and the city clerk said she'll put physical copies in the precincts as well. Yeah. That's a great, great. Cool. Yeah. Um, to, to piggyback off of um, what Commissioner Lanier said, um, I dare say I'm not trying to, not trying to say something negative about the community, but the general community might not realize how important, what the city manager is, what the city manager does, and how important the position is. So these community meetings are very important because um, it's an opportunity not only to get their input, but also to inform. Hey, because, well, frankly, thanks to Greg and our predecessors, we don't change city city managers that often. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's not like if there's an election that happens on a regular basis where you're in candidate interviews. So. Um, I know that we've done really good work um, advertising meetings or communicating to our residents through uh, uh, insert in the water bill. So then you know you're getting it out through everybody. And then and I shared this with you, but I want to sh share it again here too. That I think where those meetings happen is important. It needs to be at a neutral site because you know if you have it at a neighbor association or a large nonprofit, there may be some that might want to might not want to attend because they have issues with that group or whatever. So a school gymnasium or something like that, a neutral site, I think is very important to hold these. So we should talk about that because I think there was some some difference of opinions on whether we should have community meetings about the survey or just use other mechanisms to make sure that we get it out into the neighborhoods. Yeah, and I think and that community meetings are, I think they're important. If five people show up, it's important that we gave a good opportunity for community members to come physically and talk because that's maybe the only way they want to do it. Um, and to inform, I think that's important on both on both fronts. Okay, that's just my opinion. At what, so my hand was up for a totally different reason, but I'm just um, curious now. At what point are you saying after we have candidates narrowed down? Is that the point you're saying engage the community or for the survey purpose? No, I'm looking at the step three on page one of the interview process where it talks about facilitating robust community meetings in each ward to inform the can oh, I see. the candidate pro bono opportunity. That's what I'm talking about. I see. So so let's let's take let's try to take one thing at a time just so I can make sure that Joellen's getting good feedback. So for um, any other feedback on the actual community survey so that that can be finalized other than adding some additional information about the role of the city manager, the importance of that role, and then adding some language to item number five. Are we are we good with the community survey? And then I want to talk separately about the employee survey because that's going to be a different process. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe let's let's look at the surveys first, and then go to schedule and the items in the schedule, uh, and then we can. I just want to make sure that we kind of walk through the different pieces to make sure we're giving you good input. Does that sound good? 
So, so let's we'll come back to schedule in a minute. Um, but Commissioner, I should remind you, water bills are they don't all go out at once. It's a quarterly. Takes over a three to four month sure. period. I think there's lots of other ways to get the the word out, and we can talk some more about that. Um, so, so. Community surveys good with those changes. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about the employee survey, uh, and I know this was again some of the feedback from from this body was that we wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to really take some time and get feedback from employees about what they think is really necessary in the next the skills needed in the next city manager, um, and that was a, a value that we wanted to make sure was really clear. Uh, and so there's a separate process to get feedback from employees that Joellen will be leading um, and independently. So do you wanna talk about that? Yes, uh, so the survey for the employees is, it looks similar. Uh, the question about um, the background is the same, so we'll modify that one as well on the employee survey. The employee survey will come directly to me. Um, it will not come to the city. And the reason for that is it's through a survey monkey. We will receive all of the results and it will be confidential. So I will be the only, I will aggregate the results. You will know what the aggregated results say, but individual comments or anything like that will come to me directly. We just feel that that would be a better way for employees to be able to give input. There is an opportunity for them to make some comments. Again, they could send me an email through the Grand Rapids email. Um, and at the end of this survey, we ask them if they want to tell us which department they're in and how long they've worked for the city. But again, they don't have to do that. So if we have the information, we'll aggregate it and share it with you. But again, the the, the community survey is through 311. The employee survey is is going to be sent directly to me at my office and um, and for this survey item number four can we also make that change to mm -hmm. add other to give individuals an opportunity to weigh in the commissioners any other feedback or questions about the employee survey so again this is um, this is really twofold Joellen will be having individual stakeholder meetings with different groups of employees um, that actually start this week and there will be this survey, and this survey will go out electronically to all city employees, and, um, and then the city employees will be able to respond. It'll go directly to, to Joellen, and it'll be confidential. So I think um, October 31st is a good timeline for a targeted audience like the employees of the city. But when I look at October 31st for the community survey, I think we, and so I know we're trying to look at the employee survey, but that's fine there, but it just reminded me to go back to the community survey. And I don't think October 31st is enough time to do all of what we're thinking of doing in order to engage the community. So I'm wondering, um, Joellen, if there's room to extend the community survey beyond October 31st, if you all agree with that. I think we have a lot of targeted approaches, but I don't know that this is enough time to get it all through. Well, let's, let's finalize the employee process first and then walk through schedule. And I know um, GovHR has done community input process in, in the past. Um, including the, the county one, countywide one that they just finished up. So I know some of that informed the process. But um, so that date isn't on this schedule here. It's just listed on here, so it could potentially get missed here. So I just want to make sure. Oh, good point. Okay, yeah. so let's we'll make sure we flag that. But yeah. any other feedback on the actual surveys or the process for the the. Are we good with 311 doing community, helping assist with that, and Joellen doing the employee? Okay, good, good, good. Well, right. well, help me to understand, what is it exactly that 311 is doing? Are they just taking calls for those people who aren't interested in doing the survey themselves online? So they'll be doing a couple things. They'll be helping get the word out through their uh, electronic networks that they have. Okay. Um, they will also be um, taking any hard copy ones and inputting it. So if, if people fill out, they'll return their surveys, their hard copy surveys to 311. 311 will fill it in so that it's all done electronically and can be aggregated. And then yes, if someone needs help verbally, they can take it through the um, 311 system as well. So I, I think um, them being able to provide the, the customer service over the phone is really helpful. 
because it provides access to people who may not be savvy on, on computers. But the piece with um, doing the data entry of the information into a system seems like it fits best with the consulting firm that we've hired to do this work for us. I wouldn't want us spending extra money in our budget for employees to do what we've hired a firm to do. You know, so I'm not sure how that Yeah, works. that's a that's a good question. I, I guess I'll turn to Mayor Beth on this too. I mean, there were conversations with 311 and they felt they, my understanding is they felt they had the capacity to assist with this uh, and that it made sense for all to be in one place so it could be aggregated. But I'll, I, I'll let Mayor I Beth think, speak I think that. the discussion with Becky um, essentially is since they're going to handle the community uh, data that they should probably handle all of it because remember part of the value added by 311 doing it is to identify and isolate any zip codes where there's a under reporting of participation and where that occurs as soon as we get notice that occurs we will enhance our outreach because we want to make sure the entire community. So if you have it all integrated of the community input uh, through the three-on-one system, uh, I think it's a, a more comprehensive approach. And Becky is the one actually who suggested that they do the input, because I was, like yourself, Commissioner, thinking, well, let's just ship those off to the consultant. But if we do that, we'll have a skewed result on the data of the geographical tracking so that we can ensure uh, that you all receive good, accurate data about who's participating and who's not, and it will also provide us with the quickest way of alert that we have an underreported participation in any particular area. So that's so that's why Becky was line suggesting. Cost then, Mom, Mary Beth, pardon me. What's the bottom line cost? For, uh, Becky seemed um, to think that it was going to be de minimis. So I, because most people will do it online. Um, and, you know, the uh, script that they have, they'll have a script for it. And so most people will, they'll walk people through doing the online because they're doing other things online, paying online and everything else. So she seemed to think it was de minimis. And I have to defer uh, to Becky relative to that. Um, but I do understand what you're saying because I was thinking similar. Um, Becky isn't here, but I think that's an accurate representation of what she told me. Yeah, and that's that's um, what was relayed to me as well. And then that, uh, again, allows uh, Joellen and GovHR to spend a lot of time with these stakeholder these stakeholder groups, which hopefully is a is a good uh, representation of all of the different. Uh, not only groups, but represent different neighborhoods in our city as well. I and think neighborhoods are around that. Are we're going to do a stakeholder group with neighborhoods as well. So I think, you know, my concern more is tied to um, frequently, frequently we will hire a consulting firm and then we do some of the work. So we're, mm -hmm. we've approved some money to be spent yep. with the, you know, in, in yep. under it, the context that they're going to do yep. X, Y, and Z. Yep. And then, you know, yep. there's something different that, and yep. I, you know, I like the idea and love the service that's provided in 311. Yep. But I also know that we approved a contract and I'm just trying yep. to get the most bang I, for our buck over here. with Absolutely, the Commissioner. And I... I think you know me well. I try to squeeze every ounce of what I can get out of a contract if we're going to spend money. Keeping in mind, however, that uh, one of the overarching goals is to ensure full participation of the whole community. Absolutely. And I think uh, as a practical matter, if we bifurcate that data, then at some point 311 is going to have to go back and look at that to give a final report as to who participated. Sure. So for me, the, um, the effectiveness of the approach on compiling the data, mm -hmm. um, trust me, I wanted to make sure we get our full money's worth. Okay. And I think we will through the other focus on the assessment of okay. the candidates, uh, the tools that you reviewed being on the team. Um, but yeah, I, I do share your uh, sentiment. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I just wanted to add, originally 
I was going to do all of mm -hmm. it. Uh, it th that was the plan, right. that I would normally do the Survey Monkey, aggregate all of the information, and when we discussed it, and they brought me down to 311 when I was here last, they said, you know, we really have the, the ability to do this. It's a goal of the mayor and commission to make sure we're getting information out into the community. We're making sure that we are um, hitting all of our, our uh, residents and they're, they're able to give us input. So the, the system that you have set up is a little bit more robust, sure. which would give you that feedback. So this is a really a good test to see if we're able to reach the entire community. And then you'll have that information for the future, which I don't, I have the survey monkey capability. I don't have your 311 capability. Sure. Thank you. I, I should add, though, um, commissioners, just so that we all have um, the the same expectations here. Uh, there will be some some work done by city departments, including HR. I mean, Mary Beth HR department will continue to assist with some aspects of this process, including. Um, assisting with setting up stakeholder meetings and as we move through through this HR and Mary Beth will be the point person for Joelle and, and continue to be and work through this um, process with us so I just want to make sure that we're all clear uh, that yes the consultant group is doing the bulk of the work but there there will be some city staff support to make sure that this is this is done well as long as the city staff that's supporting isn't doing what we've signed a contract for the firm to do absolutely which is, the ins which is what this is she was going to do it there has been a change and now we're going to spend money internally to get it done we if, if we're doing this too frequently that means we're not writing our RFPs well enough because I, we should do this type of assessment before we write the RFP. So then we know exactly what it is we need, mm -hmm. and then we can have a contract that mirrors what exactly it is that we need. I think I understand this. I'm in agreement with it, and we can end the conversation about this particular topic. Okay. But I, I'm understanding where you're coming from, and I'm glad you understand where I'm coming from yeah. with it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Commissioner. It does sound like this decision was made after. after. But Becky yeah. Joe, do you want to speak Becky, to that concern speak to at the all? Cost? Sure. Um, Good morning, everyone. Um, I was straight live streaming, so I came right up. <laughs> um, as far as the dashboards, it's something that Joellen does have the capacity to do, but when she saw ours, they are just more robust. That is not done by the 301 specialist. That is done by the performance and reporting specialist, and it's something we have the skill set for that can be done very quickly. The data that we're going to be giving be get, being given is just data points, and we're going to put it into our shape file that we already use for all of your commission um, areas, your wards, sorry, your wards. And so with the zip code, and you'll be able to see that. So that really doesn't, that's probably going to take about a half hour once we get the data. We're hoping to get that weekly, but literally that'll be an automatic. As far as um, 311 agents um, taking the calls for people that don't have access to it, uh, we've done this multiple times in several different kinds of contracts with David, when David came here from Parks and different uh, from GRPD when Dave, uh, Dave was here, David again. And then the, the third thing about um, agents taking calls, again, this is a practice we put in place. I don't believe that that's normally something you would do with your contract, but we really believe our service is enough that we can take those calls in. To put input, um, we've also done this in the past. We have pockets of two, three minutes here, and this survey is rather quick, and especially when people are writing down, they might have some um, ones that are more lengthy in what they write, but that is something we have done in the past. So it, it is something I don't think that, is, especially for the dashboard, they would not have thought about that. They were going to do the dashboard. When she saw her, she just said it's more robust. It is. I mean, especially since we've been doing it now for a couple of years and putting the data there. So as far as the cost, we don't see a big jump in that as far as the data input because we do it in between our times just like we do for some of our departments. But we can definitely keep track of what that is, and I think that's important as we go through the next RFP processes and things like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Becky Chow. Commissioner? Yeah, Mayor, uh, just, just another um, comment or, or question on the survey itself. Um, when, I, when I see the um, asterisk by that, does that mean that I would have to answer those questions? And, and, and what I'm driving at is um, looking at question five and six, is that, um, you know, even though I'm, I'm an involved and, and engaged, I may not be able to, off the top of my head, know three opportunities or three challenges for the new manager, and I might stall out there, which means, so, so do I, would I have to complete those two questions or not necessarily? 
My understanding is you have to do it, but I can ask someone at my office to see if, if we can uh, bypass because because other th some of these say pick free right put, and I when I went through it myself and tried it I just went to go to the next page and it said go back and, and answer right yeah because so, I'm yeah because I'm, I'm just thinking to actually type out three opportunities or, or three challenges I mean, you might not get as many re surveys filled and I think you know w what you want to get that all I think getting the other five questions would be super valuable from a larger pool so okay. just a thought Good advice. Thanks. Okay, so any other questions or comments about the surveys and the recommended process on getting the input? Okay, so now let's talk about process. And Joellen um, is presenting us with a couple options, and this is where we want to provide input on uh, timeline and overall process moving forward. So Joellen, you want to walk us through it first, and then we can uh, we can talk about it and give some input. Sure. Okay. So I'll skip to step three because we're right we're in step two right now. Uh, so step three uh, is what we're talking about today, which is the meeting with the stakeholder groups, employees, community meetings, and then putting the, the draft profile together. So actually, um, what we discussed um, in lieu of having community meetings was having the stakeholder groups and the surveys, and then some meetings with the employees, and having the community input forms on the back end when the can candidates are identified. So the profile will be written with with the input that you already gave me, the input from the surveys, and the stakeholder groups. The, the profile will be written, you will approve that, we will advertise, we will go through the process, and then as I go into the interview process, you will see that there will be community forums where people will be invited and the candidates will be asked questions, mm -hmm. the candidates will respond, and then the community could give input after that. So that that is one change from what was originally recommended. Um, moving on to step four, uh, my, my goal would be, well, I should stay on step three, my goal would be back here on November 14th to have you approve the profile. The reason why the surveys are due October 31st and we could push it till the end of that week is would it would allow me then to write the text. I would like your eyes on the text before the 14th. As you recall in the conversations we had, I said you will see this before it actually comes to you formally for approval. So on the 14th, my goal is to have it in the final format with the pictures and the, and the brochure and it will look nice. But prior to that, sometime between the beginning of November and the 14th, you'll have a text document that you'll all need to read to say we agree with this. That's why there is that lag. So I could push it a few days, but that next week I'm going to have to finalize the text and get it to you so you at least have a few days to read it and give me some feedback. Then the idea would, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, if, that's okay. Commissioner Jones? Yeah, just wondering, Joellen, um, are you in need of a, signif a significant amount of time to draft the candidate profile? I mean, how much time do you need? So um, the, the, the bones of it as far as the background of the city, this, the form of government, all of the attributes of Grand Rapids, I can work on that now. Okay. Um, and we did some of that for the county. I did show it to the mayor. There is some really good information in there. I'm not going to use it verbatim, but there is some really good information in there that I may bring over. So okay. that can be done before the end of the month. But but And you all gave me some feedback, which I've already kind of formalized in, in my head. It's probably some things I think I'm going to hear in the community. And then I'll start to write the characteristics and traits, um, the management style, the challenges and opportunities, but I can't finish that piece of it, which is pretty lengthy, until the process is done, until I can aggregate the results of the survey from the employees in the community, and then I'll have to add to it. So I'll need so a few days that following week to finalize it and get it to you. So my goal would be to get it to you the first full week of November for you all to look at so I can finalize it and be back here on the 14th. So, I, I, so Commissioner, so if we look at the calendar, if we get the survey out by the end of today or tomorrow morning, that's that's three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, if we pushed it back it, even to that end of that following week or even November 6th, that would be a full month for the input process, um, community input process. Uh, so is that is that feasible then for you to still have time to do that and get something to us by the end of that week for us to review before the 14th? 
<laughs> yes. I, I mean, I really, I really would have it. I'd yeah, prefer like it end on the, the Friday, so I have that weekend. I really would like to get it to you by the seventh or the eighth, so then okay. we can finish it. So I, because I still have to put it into the finalized format and have it for you on the 14th. The only difference between when you see the text and the 14th is if you if we do make any changes, I would make the changes to the text and then it will just have the pictures in it. So that's really the only difference you'll see. Um, but, but I'd prefer to have it so I can finish it and get it to you because I don't expect you to get it one day and get back to me in a few hours. I would so, like so to give you. So potentially we could just move that then to Friday, November 3rd. Sure. To provide yeah. closer to um, four weeks. After uh, the position is advertised on November 15th, uh, we will then have the applications open for about a month. And then um, there is a review period uh, for me to go through the applications, determine who most closely meets your profile. I then will Skype interviews with those individuals. We will do some background screening for those individuals. And when I come back on the uh, on the 16th of January or another day, we have to talk about which process. Um, we are going to, um, oh no, I'm sorry. When I come back on the 14th, I'm also going to be giving you some hypothetical situations for the candidates to respond to. So after the community input is received, I will craft some items for you to consider that once the candidates are identified by me of who I think meets your profile, I am going to have them do some work as part of the vetting process. So when you receive the candidate profiles in January, you will also have the benefit of not only their resumes and the background screening and all of the information I get from the Skype interviews, checking some references and the other due diligence, you'll have some work that they've actually completed that relates to the city and some of the um, issues that you may be facing. So the, the November 15th it will be posted and you'll see there's a December 12th to January 5th review or a um, and the profile coming to you either the 5th or the 12th. So if you look a little bit further down, I have two processes outlined for the interviews. And um, the difference between option one and option two is that option one is more condensed. Mm -hmm. Option two just spreads it out further. So if you go with option one, it allows me then to get you the candidate profiles by January 12th I would come back on site on January 16th, and I'm on step five right now, and uh, talk with you about what I found out about the candidates and who I think most closely meets the profile and who you may want to consider for an interview. And then if you move to step six and step seven and step eight, you can see the process. So we would then move from the 16th of January to the 29th, you would have interviews probably the entire day, depending on how many candidates you choose to bring in. We would then move to the 30th um, and have the candidates come back, um, do tours of the city, have interviews with some community stakeholder groups, have some employee roundtable meetings, have the community forum in the evening that we discussed, and then take a leadership assessment if you choose to do that. And there's multiple tools that we could use. I would then receive all of the feedback, and I will tell you that for the stakeholder groups, for the employee roundtable groups, I will give them a feedback form that they can fill out. I will aggregate those results for you. For the community forum, they will still have access to the email to give me feedback, as well as comment cards for anyone who attends, and I will collect all of that. And I will aggregate all of that information and give you a report by February 2nd. So then you can get all of the feedback from the constituent groups, the stakeholder groups, and everyone that's been involved in the interview process. After that, your final interviews would be on the 6th, which is a Tuesday, um, in the afternoon, 
and then um, my recommendation in either option would be that you would identify a successful candidate and commence um, negotiations. I would not recommend you announce anyone until you have the negotiations completed. Um, and hopefully there'll be multiple candidates that you would like to work with. So we, you know, depending on how the negotiations go, we will be, we will be good. Okay. So that's the first process. And the reason why it's condensed is that once you name those finalists um, after the first interviews, which would be on January 29th, it's public information. So the idea then is to condense that period of time. And um, if we're finished on the 6th, that gives us all the way up until about the 16th to finalize an employment agreement. And in my experience, um, you do not finalize an employment agreement in a day or two. You really need about a week you know, I will be up front with people. I have a lot of information already about what the package is. I would share that with the finalist candidates so they know coming in, uh, you know, what they can expect. Maybe you will vary a little bit, um, but they will have all of that information up front. But they still may need some time. The second option um, is a little bit different. Um, and, oh, and you can see at the end there, it, you have the negotiations co completed on the 16th and then with a vote on the 20th and um, employment possibly commencing on March 25th. That will be one of the things I will ask the candidates about if they are employed right now, if they are city managers or county administrators, they may have an out clause in a contract that could be up to 60 or 90 days. So we, so the goal would be March 25th, but I just want you to know that sometimes it, it could be a little bit longer than that and it's just out of our control. Mm -hmm. The second option would be to have me come a little bit earlier on January 9th um, to present candidates. Um, and again, you know, this, this is just more protracted on my end for the vetting process. Then you would uh, conduct your first interviews on the 17th of January. You'd identify finalists. Um, you'd start the in community engagement process um, about two weeks later on the 29th. Um, again, it's the same process that I highlighted in the first option, where you'd have the tours, you'd have the meetings, the employee roundtable meetings, the community forum, and the leadership assessment if you choose. Um, I would put the report together for you, get it to you by February 9th, and then your final interviews would be on the 13th. Um, it gives us a little less time, you can see, to, to get a contract, you know, agreed upon. It only gives us a few days, and then you would still be on your February 20th deadline. Joellen, can you talk a little bit about pros and cons? Um, Joel, Joellen shared with me um, some of the pros and cons, and I said, you know, let's talk about this as a full commission. Um, obviously, once it's public, the candidates are public, um, that um, creates different dynamics for the candidates. Uh, but then also Joellen was thinking about how many times if there are candidates from other communities, other cities, uh, then they have to travel here. So trying to be really mindful of that as well um, and being thoughtful about their time and trying to reduce the number of trips instead of three different trips down to two. So that was some of the, the back and forth and that's why we have two options before us. I wasn't comfortable making that decision. I, I said, let's bring it to the full commission and I'll let the commission weigh in on that. Um, so I will, I will, and anything else to add? Did I miss anything about kind of your thought process? Just, you highlighted everything, but just on the front and back end. So if you think about it, we're going to have applications close on December 15th, mm -hmm. which could be good or bad, but the holidays are coming up. So if I'm trying to Skype with people, check references, ask them to do some preliminary work, and maybe we might have three or four questions and you're going to want written responses to them, it's over the holidays. My experience is that sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. So giving me, and that's selfish, an extra few days on the front end would allow me to have a, a better package for you. I wouldn't be as rushed, and the candidates wouldn't be as rush, rushed. And then on the back end of the first option, um, you have more time to negotiate that, that agreement. In addition to all of the things the mayor said, less trips, um, less public, you know, these candidates are go probably going to be employed in a lot of cases. Um, they, their names will be public, and that may or may not have ramifications for them back in their, in their home communities. Um, and the cost. You know, if you can minimize trips, if there are people coming from out of the area, um, that would be beneficial to the city as well. 
Um, and and uh, Joel, and one other thing in this list, uh, and I'm pretty sure you heard from most of us on this specific question, was the specific question about um, having the candidates do an assessment once we get to the final round. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that there's a consensus that we want to do some type of leadership assessment. Uh, and we, when do we need to make a decision about that assessment? Is that later on? You'll provide us with a few options and we can weigh in on that. Yeah, what I would like to do before I recommend a tool, there's several tools you can use, is to see what the leader, the profile says and what you want to measure. Smart. So I think we could probably have that discussion in November uh, when I come back because I would like to talk with you about the hypothetical situations or maybe real life situations that you want to have people write about as part of the, the vetting process. And then we can talk about the leader profile so I can get make sure I have the right costs and the time frame to do all of that okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you for that okay so commissioners um, in looking at option one versus two uh, what what are your thoughts and what's your preference Commissioner? Um, I like option one just to for the sake of shrinking the amount of time people would need to go back and forth. I think that, that that portion makes sense. This is this too provides you, Joellen, enough time mm -hmm. because it's later, if I'm understanding, it's a little bit later in January yes. then. Yes. So yeah, I prefer option one for those two reasons. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I too uh, prefer option one. I think we need to take the time that's needed for this and it'll save us some expense as well. This is a huge decision we're making and we don't want to rush it. Your points about the holidays are well taken. Thank you. Um, and uh, those are good points. Commissioners, any, any other thoughts? Are we all, co I'm comfortable with one as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I think once we finalize this, we can get a tentative date for the community forum. We can find a location for that. We can, uh, we can start to work through some of these logistics and get dates made available so that people can get those on their schedule early. Um, any other feedback? Are we are we all in consensus, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Allen? Are you put saying one, yeah. one? Okay, so it sounds like one is the is the preference, uh, Mayor Beth. Okay, so once you uh, conclude your decisions on this, I think the most important thing I found working with you all that's important that I told Joellen is the pathway towards communicating with you in the future. On uh, so uh, anything in between, it will be an email. Um, I, It'll come through me because, you know, you got so much going on, you won't remember who Joellen is. But but she will always be copied, and I will always say in the text, urgent, please review and respond, because this is fast moving after this. And so I think that's just a logistic uh, step I want, I want to make sure you all are aware of. You want to make sure we get back to you right away. Yeah. OK. <laughs> so we're all, we're all hearing that loud and clear. Um, I have a question, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner. So Commissioner Allen um, brought up the question about the community meetings before yeah. um, the profile. And I know that when we were talking about doing this on our own, I was saying that um, I think the community is engagement fatigued and we need to figure out other ways to try and draw in um, the feedback from the community and I think we have um, we had identified many ways that we could do that but I just want to make sure that my colleague is okay with us um, having the community engagement after the profile is created and later when we have candidates is that okay 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 thank you thank you thank you commissioner and uh, I, I appreciate you saying that and um, some I've, I've heard that from other commissioners as well that there are other ways and um, consistent with some of the other things that we're doing, we really need to think about other ways to engage a larger, um, broader spectrum of our community than just having meetings. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for example, one of the stakeholder groups is neighborhood associations. There's entire swaths in our city that are covered by neighborhood associations. Right. Right. Just as an example. Yeah. Yeah. And again, commissioners, please, if you if you see a stakeholder that you think is missing, um, please identify that today and get that to um, Mary Beth uh, or myself, and we'll finalize that so that we can make sure that everyone gets a personal invitation. So we'll be sending out personal invitations once we nail down the dates and times of those stakeholder meetings. And um, on some of these, you can see it's, it, it's kind of fluid.
fluid. So if an uh, uh, individual can't attend one stakeholder meeting, they can always um, attend another one. It, so there is some overlap in them, and so we're going to we're going to try to accommodate as many stakeholders with nine different groups, um, with eight to twelve individuals invited each. That's going to be well over a hundred um, folks invited to be a part of that process. And Mayor, I, so when we were um, putting together a list before, I on my own went through to determine whether they were within the ward and within the city, and then in which ward, because I think equity is extremely important in that sense. And so if anyone has already done that for this list, that would be great. That'll save me time from trying to do that myself. Um, but after I do that, then I may make some um, suggestions about um, you know, who we have here. I think people who are representing organizations that are within the city of Grand Rapids, you know, they may make sense even if they live in a different surrounding community. But definitely when we get to the point of um, neighborhood businesses, local business owners, community partners, and things of that nature, I want to make sure that there's equity across the city. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Commissioner. All right, commissioners, any other comments about surveys or process? Are we all comfortable with this moving forward? If you haven't had a chance to talk to Joellen or if after you talked to Joellen you had some additional thoughts or additional feedback, please reach out to her. She's really accessible. You can contact her by phone. Um, I believe all of us have her phone number or you can email her. Uh, I anticipate we'll all be having ongoing conversations with Joellen um, throughout this entire process and as questions come up. All right, are we good with this? Mm -hmm. Yes, we will be working on a press release to get this out to the community so that people are really clear about the process. Um, we'll also be having a press release and working with uh, HR and 311 to get the community uh, survey out. And then Joellen will work with Mary Beth to get the employee surveys out. Stakeholder meetings internally start this week. Um, externally will start next week and the week after that. Uh, and we'll make sure that all of you have the information so that you also can help spread the word. Am I missing anything, Joellen? I think, no. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. I look forward to working with all of you, and thanks for all the conversations, too. I really appreciate it. It was very, very insightful. So thank thanks you. for being here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any final thoughts on that? So, commissioners, a couple of things just to make sure you're aware of. We, um, economic development today was, economic development project team today was canceled. Uh, and so we do not have that this afternoon. So that means we are back here tonight for our 7 p.m. meeting. All right. And with that, it's 11.05 and we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>